Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lutheran Church of the Cross. It is Transfiguration Sunday, the day we celebrate the transfiguration of our Lord, and I'm so glad that you all are here with us this morning. Let's begin the way that we have been beginning with a moment of silence to just close our eyes, to take some deep breaths, and to prepare our hearts for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all of our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins, and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. join me in the prayer of the day. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we've got Bill with the children's sermon this morning. <clears throat> okay. Uh, today, the children's sermon. First, I'm going to hold up the sign and see what it says. That ain't what you got, it's the way that you use it. That's an old song from long ago. And ain't what you got, it's the way that you use it. Now, let's think about that. There are lots of things that we can use. Here's a baseball bat. See this? A baseball bat. We use that sometimes to play baseball. But if you hit somebody over the head, 
really hard. That's good shit. No, it ain't what you got. It's the way that you use it. Okay. How about uh, a pen or a pencil? Here's a pen. Here's a pencil. Right? Okay. Can you write nice things? Well, sure. We write things every every week. We write things for sure. Some people write a check for something, or they write nice letters, or it's Valentine's Day, and you can write that says, I love you, Mom. I love you, Dad. I love you, honey. You can write, I love you, and that's a nice thing. But could you write a nasty note with something like that? Sure. There are people who ba do bad things with a pen and pencil. They write a bad check, or they do something nasty, or they say, I hate you. Uh, that's not a good thing. So you can use, and hey, what you got is the way that you use it. Okay, oh, hey, we got some, ma I got some, a bad book of matches here, right? Okay. And, if we can, <laughs> there you go, there's a match. Do we use matches for a good? Well, we light the candles with them at church. But you could use a match to set fire to something you burn down somebody's house. Wow. That's a bad thing, right? Okay. Oh, here's a, where is that little pocket knife? I have a little pocket knife here someplace. I've got a pocket knife here. A little pocket knife. Look at this. This little pocket knife. That was made in 1910. That's over 110 years ago. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? A little pocket knife. Well, I, you can't carry them to school anymore, but I'll tell you, you can use it to open an envelope. You could use it to cut string. You can use it to sharpen a pencil. Here's a story, this a true story. When I was in the fourth grade, my teacher, my teacher knew that I carried a little pocket knife. In the fourth grade, I had a little pocket knife in my pocket, a little one, like this. And she said, Bill, we didn't have electric pencil sharpeners on the wall. My teacher asked me, she said, Bill, can I borrow your pocket knife? I want to sharpen a pencil. <laughs> can you imagine that today? <laughs> no. Why? Because some people must have used a pocket knife, a little knife, to cut somebody or hurt somebody. So, and it, what you got, it's the way that you use it. There's a little pocket knife, and you can't carry those to school anymore. But when I was a child, a hundred years ago, <laughs> you could do that, okay? How about words? Are any word, words, are words a good thing or bad? Well, we use words to talk all the time. Okay, we've got words for animals. We have we're a word for dog. We've got a word for pig. But could you use that in a bad way? If you said this way, oh, pfft, you're a dog. That's not a very nice thing. If you said, eh, she's a pig. <laughs> That's not very nice. No. So words can be used good or bad, and it, what you got, it's the way that you use it. How about beer and wine and whiskey? Well, we've had beer and wine and whiskey for a long, long time, and we drink wine in church. That's a good thing, right? We have a little, I've got a little glass of wine here. We're gonna have for communion. But there's some people who drink too much and they get drunk. And if you get drunk and then you go driving in a car and you have an accident or hurt somebody or kill somebody in your car or just if you just wreck your car that's not good so too much beer or wine or whiskey too much of that stuff not a good thing so and it what you got is the way that you use it that's the big thing to remember for today's lesson, and it, what you got is the way that you use it. You have to use it for good. That's the story for the day. Bye bye.
The first reading is from 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay there here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, father, father the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The refrain of our Psalm today is out of Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines, God shines forth in glory. The mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the writhing, rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silent with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the right, rightness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. Out of Zion, perfect in beauty. can't read the end of it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the second reading is from 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you all to open your ears and your hearts to hear the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory 
Our glory to you. Our glory to you. <clears throat> Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please join me in a prayer. Good and gracious God, thank you for this day that you have blessed us with. Thank you for this online platform that enables us to gather as community, and thank you for the community that is gathered here. Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon us, send your Holy Spirit upon me, so that some word of mine may be some word of yours for someone who needs to hear it today. In Jesus' almighty life-giving name, amen. So today is Lesson Sunday, and we've been tinkering with how we do Lesson Sunday on, on Zoom, and it seems like we, we may have found a good spot for it now, and so we'll continue to go with that. And today, we celebrate the transfiguration of our Lord. This brings the season of Pentecost, not Pentecost, the season of Epiphany to a close, and it pushes us towards Ash Wednesday, which will be this Wednesday, and then the beginning of the 40 days of Lent, the season of Lent, leading us towards Holy Week and Easter. Now, today we find ourselves in Mark, and Mark is in the New Testament, and Mark is a gospel. A go and the word gospel means good news. Mark is one of the synoptic gospels, along with Matthew and Luke. And remember that word synoptic means shares a similar vision, a synchronized vision, a shared story. Matthew, Mark, and Luke widely tell the same story about Jesus, whereas John is a little different. 75% of so of John is unique exclusively to John's gospel. Now, Mark was actually a source text for the writing of Matthew and Luke, along with another source, which we only know as Q or QL, which literally means source. And we don't have Q anymore. Like we don't, we, we, we know what would have been in this Q source, but we don't have the Q source. So Mark was a source gospel for Matthew and Luke as well. Mark is the shortest gospel. Mark is to the point. Mark uses this word immediately over and over again. I always say sometimes it feels like the author of Mark's gospel is, is pushing Jesus through the story. He did this, and then immediately he went here and did that, and then immediately he went here and did that. This word appears over and over again throughout the gospel of Mark. Another unique thing about Mark's gospel is that there's no nativity story, and in its original form, there's no resurrection story either. So Mark's gospel begins with Jesus getting baptized because Mark, as an author, doesn't see the need to tell a nativity story. It's not about the way Jesus was born. It's about Jesus's life and ministry. And then at the end, Mark's story ends with an empty tomb. So we're to presume that Jesus has been resurrected, but we never meet the resurrected Christ in Mark's gospel. So just some unique things about Mark's gospel there. In today's story, Jesus takes uh, Peter and James and John and leads them up a high mountain. 
And it's funny, one of my commentaries said it was probably Mount Hermon, but it's irrelevant because this is a theological lesson, not a geographical lesson. So don't get caught up on what mountain it may have been. And then it says, Jesus is transfigured before them. His clothes become a dazzling white. And the author of Mark's gospel feels compelled to tell us so white that no one on earth could bleach them. So we know that's pretty white, right? And it's this idea, it's this imagery, this bright, dazzling white. It's kind of reminiscent of Moses. When Moses went up to Mount Sinai and after he was in the presence of God, he came down and they said his hair was white and he was radiant. He just oozed this power of God, this presence of God. And so let's think about that word transfiguration. Because a lot of times folks think transfiguration and they think about Jesus metamorphosizing into Elijah and Moses as well. And that's not what the transfiguration is. The transfiguration, Moses and Elijah showed up to the transfiguration, don't get me wrong, but the transfiguration is about Jesus himself being transformed, being metamorphosized, looking like this uh, again, this dazzling white figure. It's a glimpse into what the post-resurrection Jesus is going to look like. We, we typically see this, this fully human Jesus, but this is a glimpse of the fully divine Jesus as well. We're going to talk more about that. The Greek word that's used for transfiguration is also the same word that's used in Romans 12, where it says, be not conformed to the ways of this world, but to be transformed by the way of God, right? So being, we too are to be transfigured to be more like God and Jesus. It's also used in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that we are, are being transformed by the work of God in this world. We are being transfigured as well. So Jesus is transfigured. Jesus is transformed and it's this bright, radiant Light Again, this glimpse of the post-resurrection Jesus. And then, in the midst of the transfiguration, okay, that's when Moses and Elijah show up and start talking to Jesus. And what I really like to wonder is, how did Peter, James, and John know that it was Moses and Elijah? Did they have their names on their t-shirts? Did they hand them business cards when they arrived? Did... Did they grow up with posters of Moses and Elijah on their wall like we grow up with sports heroes and rock star posters on our wall? I don't know, but they knew it was Moses and Elijah. So why? Why do Moses and Elijah appear? Why not Amos and Jonah? Why not Ruth and, uh, um, take your pick, anybody, Ruth and David, right? So why did, who, why did Moses and Esther, that's the other word I was looking for. Why didn't Ruth and Esther show up? Yes. So why Moses and Elijah? What is the significance of this? Well, on a surface level, we think about the lives of Moses and Elijah. They were both prophetic. They both performed miracles. They both opposed the power structures of their time. They both suffered for the faith. Is this starting to sound like anyone else who's at this party today? Yes. Jesus fits all this criteria as well. But the thing is, Jesus will exceed the work and the message of Moses and Elijah. You see, Moses and Elijah are also there because they represent the law and the prophets. Moses the law, Elijah the prophets. And so, but Jesus is there representing the gospel, and the gospel is the fulfillment of, of the law and the prophets. Remember when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love your neighbor, love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, and your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on this. And so Jesus is the fulfillment. The gospel is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And it's unique to notice too, as we heard today in that, that reading from Kings, that Elijah doesn't die, right? And so Elijah was just whisked away up to heaven with a chariot of fire and horses of fire. That must have been quite a sight to see. And we hear that Moses dies, but there was also some folklore that maybe Moses didn't die, that maybe Moses entered heaven as well. That's 
Again, scripture tells us that Moses died and he was buried in an unknown location. But some folks kept this legend alive that Moses never died. So this is the idea that they are there. But the thing is, Jesus will exceed them again because Jesus will die, but Jesus will be resurrected, right? And so Peter is having his mind blown, as you can only imagine, that Jesus is transfigured. Moses and Elijah have shown up. Peter has to say something, right? Because that we even know that feeling. When we're in uh, crazy situations, we feel compelled to speak too, right? And sometimes later we wish we hadn't. So Peter says, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Now, the fact that Peter calls Jesus Rabbi, which means teacher, as we know, just immediately after Peter has identified Christ as the Messiah at Caesarea Philippi, shows that Peter, even in this moment, continues to fall short. Rather than calling him Messiah or Lord, he still calls him Rabbi. And so Peter says, let's make three dwelling places, or booths, as, as the original text would say. Let's make three dwelling places, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why does he want to build these tents, these booths? Well, there's speculation a million ways, right? One, he wants, maybe he wants to stay. I mean, if you were on a mountaintop in the presence of God and Moses and Elijah show up, don't you think this is probably as good as it's going to get? I want to hang out here, right? Or maybe it's because this, uh, this, this Jewish holiday was occurring at the time, the festival of booths, if you will, to celebrate the Ark of the Covenant. And so maybe he says, hey, we're here. Let's celebrate the festival of booths, right? And also, too, there was this idea that, that the apocalypse would happen at the festival of booths. This is another part of lore as well. Uh, or maybe he just wanted to memorialize the event. We don't know. We, we can speculate all we want, all day long. And then I love the next line. He didn't know what to say because he was terrified. Don't we all know that feeling, right? When we all, as I just said, we blurt out, we're in a stressful situation, we're in an unreal situation, we just say something because we feel like we need to say something, but we don't know what to say. That's what Peter is doing right here. And I can't blame him, right? Again, think of the situation. Then it tells us that a cloud overshadows them. Does this sound familiar? Has God ever been in the form of a cloud before? Is this symbolic? Is this reminiscent? Yes, of course, we've heard in Scripture before that the cloud represents the divine presence. As God led the Israelites through the Exodus, he led them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, right? And as this cloud envelops them, they hear this voice. This is my son, my beloved Listen to him. Does he say listen to Moses? No, don't listen to the law. Does he say listen to Elijah? No, we don't need the prophets. Listen to Jesus, my son. There's lots to unpack here. This is symbolic and, and important and representative in so many different ways. First off, in the gospel lessons, we only hear God, the Father, and this disembodied voice speak twice. It happens at the Transfiguration, and we just talked about it a few weeks ago. When did God the Father also speak? At the baptism of Jesus. So God the Father speaks to God the Son twice that we know of in the, new, in the, in the Gospel lessons. There actually is, I'm going to cheat and say there is a third time. I can't remember what it is, but there is a, a third time in one of the Gospels. But we're going to stick with canon here. We're going to stick with the big ones. So twice God speaks. And why? What is the significance of God speaking to Jesus? Well, when he speaks to him at the baptism, it says, you are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. It's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And part of me, the theologian in me, wonders if knowing that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, the human Jesus needs to hear that encouragement from God the Father. So if that's the theme, if that's the reality of it, if Jesus needs to know that God the Father loves him and that he is fulfilling what God has, has sent him to do, he may need that same encouragement now because this is the conclusion of Jesus's earthly ministry. Because when they leave this mountain, 
Jesus starts to head towards where? Jerusalem. And what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem? It's not pretty, right? And so perhaps this fully human savior of ours needed to hear his father's love and support at the beginning of his ministry, and he needed to hear his father's love and support as he headed into what he knew was his ultimate doom. Also, as far as the New Testament goes, this is the last time we hear God the Father speak. Why is that? Well, whose voice are we supposed to be listening to now? The voice of Jesus. He literally just told us, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. So all the times before, God working through the law with Moses, all the times before, God working through the prophets with Elijah, through Isaiah, and all of those guys, and now God the Father is saying, listen to Jesus. The gospel fulfills everything that came before, and this is the new word. Then it's all gone. It's all gone. The bright white, the clouds, Moses, Elijah, it's all gone, and they look up, and Jesus is there, and he leads them down the mountain. Come on, boys, we got work to do. And he tells them, don't tell anyone until after the Son of Man has been killed and risen from the dead. Again, another, another theme of Mark's gospel is what we call the messianic secret, this idea that Jesus doesn't want them to tell people that he is the Messiah. But yet he affirms here that after his death and resurrection, the good news can and must be proclaimed. So don't tell anyone about this work until it's time for you to be doing the work. So, Transfiguration Sunday, the transfiguration of our Lord. I've gabbed on enough. I really enjoy this holiday. Um, I think it's very significant. And so I now invite your questions, comments, thoughts, uh, anything you observed in the text or anything I had to say. There's always the funny part where my students would, would get quiet after a lesson and they were like, I was like, no questions? And they're like, no, you, you, you just did a great job. We, no, we, we don't have any questions. I'm like, you guys are yanking my chain. You're terrified. <laughs> they don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, they were terrified. They did not know what to say. I almost said. <laughs> okay. Seeing no questions, we can, uh, we can move on. So let us all continue to be transfigured by what God is doing to us through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one bap baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all the people in need. For the gospel proclaimed in word and deed, for communities of faith far and near, and for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For creation, sun, moon, and stars, life forming in the dark earth and ocean deep, mountains, clouds, and storms, and creatures seen and unseen, and for the Holy Spirit's guidance in our stewardship of God's creation, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders and security guards, attorneys and advocates, civil servants and leaders of government, that they witness to mercy and justice throughout the world, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all who suffer this day, that Christ our healer transforms sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. Let us keep our those who are suffering and serving during this pandemic, strengthen and sustain them, O oh Lord. We also are praying for Warren Groling, Lyle Ann Musselman, Jenny Ritchie, all those working and living in, at Delaware Justice and Rehabilitation Center, Cole Ackley, Ron Rusa, Phil and Barb Wills, Heidi Hillison, Sandy Lamfort, Ray Greving, Laura Chalmers, Gerald Manor, V and Rusty Valerie, Scott Reno, Stevie Lakes, Janice Reddick, Pastor Ted Stoneberg, and in the ELCA, the churches that are seeking pastors and pastors seeking churches. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For companions in life's journey in this worshiping community, for loved ones who cannot be with us this day, and for guidance during struggles we face, that God's glory is revealed around and among us, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Here other intercessions may be offered. You know, I always put a plug in for our folks in the military men and women serving currently on uh, active duty stateside overseas. So we pray for all our people and their families. And then today, with all the snow and ice and terribly cold weather, let's pray for the families of all those people who've been killed or injured on the highways just in the past couple of three days. I've, I've seen reports of people in Texas, Pennsylvania, every place 
getting killed or injured on the highway. So our prayers go out to all those people who are being killed or injured on the highway. Pray for them, fam their families. For all these people, Lord, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their earthly pilgrimage, that their lives of service and prayer inspire us in our living. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I mean, the peace of Christ to be with you. And also with you. They're a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Peace be with you. Peace, everybody. God's peace. God's peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, everyone. All right, it's time for our time of offering, and we've been using this time as a time to share in uh, just places where we've seen kindness and generosity in the world, in the news, in our own lives, uh, or just a time to share in general thanksgivings as well. And so, just again, always. The church wants to say thank you to all of you for the ways in which you continue to support the ministry that we all do here. So thank you for that. Any other, anyone else have any other uh, offerings or, or things that they're thankful for? I'm thankful for the second vaccine. Hey, all right. Yes. It's great. Congratulations. Harley. Yes. <laughs> It's a good thing. And, and a person that gave it to me at the hospital was Kelly Wolf, who uh, I actually knew. So I made it even better. Awesome. Anyone else have anything they'd like to lift up? Quiet crowd this morning. Must be anticipating that snowstorm and, uh, and great anxiety. <laughs> when we do birthdays. Yeah, absolutely. Got turned 50 on Tuesday. I saw that. The big 5-0. Happy birthday to Scott. I think it's James Hillison's birthday today. Oh, I think, oh, I think it is too, because my Denver son and he share a birthday. Yep. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Cool. Well, it's also a pretty popular feast day or day of commemoration today. Today, the church remembers St. Valentine. So uh, I wish I could tell you more about him, but there's not a whole lot to be known about him. He was an early church saint and uh, an early church martyr. And a lot of what we know about a lot of those old timey saints and martyrs is that we really don't know a whole lot about them that's not folklore. So I can't, I can't enamor you with stories of St. Valentine this morning. Maybe that'll be Tuesday's devotional video. All right, well, June, if you would like to lead us in the offering prayer. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. Yeah. All 
All right, let us transition to our time of communion. So make sure that you have your communion elements ready, your bread and wine, your grape juice and crackers, whatever you have. And if you don't have elements, take this time to remember the last time you received the Lord's Supper or a particularly meaningful time that you took it. And hold that in your heart and know that that outward sign of God's grace is still sufficient and still sustains you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Healing and redeeming God, it is our honor and our joy to give you thanks and praise, because you have looked with mercy on us in our fallenness, in the liberation of your people from slavery, in the making of the covenant with Moses, we see your constant purpose to restore us to fullness of life and everlasting relationship with you. You turn outcasts into disciples, and in moments of healing, you give us a foretaste of our calling to be whole and holy in your presence. In Jesus, you show us what it means to be wholly alive and wholly yours. And so with the whole company of earth and heaven, we glorify your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of life and breath, you bathe us in the waters of baptism and feed us in the fellowship of communion and renew us through acts of mercy. In this holy meal, you show us the cost of your son's crucifixion and the glory of his resurrection, and you empower us to shape our lives after his. Send down your Holy Spirit that your church may find its very life in the healing of your world. Send that same spirit upon this bread and this cup that they may be for us, the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. who on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to each of his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to each of his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. As we gather around the mystery of the Lord's Supper, let us remember that great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Humble God, in Christ you became what we are, that we might become what you are. You call us to do difficult things in the power of your Spirit, and you invite us to do simple things to respond to your grace. Embolden your people with strength and courage to do the difficult things you call them to do. But also bless your children with patience and dignity when you summon them to do simple things. Visit all who labor with chronic illness or challenging disability. Renew your body in the world to embrace those who are excluded from freedom or companionship. Heal your creation and bring forth the day when your abundant life flows like rivers of gold. Through Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit, we pray to you, O Father. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, Jude will lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and to serve others in your name. Amen. Amen. We will continue with the mission statement. Together in Christ, we celebrate God's love, grace, and forgiveness through worship and service. With the Spirit's guidance, we faithfully teach and learn, love and welcome, and care for each other, our community, and the world. Going out into the world, may God the Creator strengthen you. Jesus the Beloved fill you, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter. Amen.
Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Bingo.